Yo, what's up? Come on in, sit down, and buckle up. We have an absolutely loaded show for you all today. I'm Travis Jenkins, your comedically challenged host. I'm going to start out by talking about the quote-unquote forgotten rural America and its associated rural brain drain. And then a little later, we'll have a panel discussion on the necessity of four-year college degrees and the rising cost of college tuition. I'll end the show with a new segment called Trav's Travesties, where we go through a few of the previous week's eye-catching headlines with a little bit of humor. Okay, so we're going to start by talking about the Forgotten Rural America, which was a TEDx talk given at Ohio State University by a woman named Michaela Bodie. So she starts this TED talk by saying that in the 2016 election, she thought that a lot of the comments that were made painted rural towns as blighted and rusted out communities with almost little to no opportunities. She also states that the trend recently in rural America for the last one to two generations is that young people move to urban centers from their rural towns and communities to pursue higher education and then once they get their degrees never return and thus terming it the rural brain drain. In the beginning of the talk she mentions that the top 30 to 40 percent of rural high school graduating classes go to these urban centers to get their college degrees and get higher education. And once in those urban areas, experience diversity. And that's not just racial diversity or different religions or experiencing different sexual identities or ethnic affiliations, but it's also experiencing diversity of economic opportunity that themselves and their parents probably have never seen before. So these young people who move away into these urban centers to pursue higher education can find it difficult to return to a place that many consider stuck in the times in terms of social progress. These young people also opt out of taking on the family farm if it was offered to them, which leads to a lot of the small family-run farms being sold off to large corporate farming operations. And maybe one of the most tragic things, she argues, is when rural Americans turn to drugs and alcohol to cope with their own economic hardship. She states that this could be one of the great silent tragedies of our time. Michaela argues that the flight of young people from rural America has a lot to do with the current political polarization here in the United States. There are less diverse perspectives and less young people available to vote and be leaders in these rural communities. Now, you may be starting to wonder, what is the proposed solution for these issues? Well, she suggests investing in small and young farmers, since it's now become more socially desirable to go to a farmer's market and buy food from locally grown sources. So now I'd like to add a few of my own thoughts on this matter. I'd like to start off by saying that I am one of these people that she is talking about. In, in this TED Talk, in that I grew up in a very small town, about uh, five to 7,000 people, just across the Ohio River from Wheeling, West Virginia, a little town called Martins Ferry, Ohio. I have absolutely nothing against rural towns, small towns, and rural communities, because I thoroughly enjoyed growing up in an area where I felt like everybody was my neighbor, and everybody knew my dad, my grandfather, my family, my friends, everybody knew each other. And then there was, you know, the not maybe so nice thing of everybody knew your business too, which didn't help when I was going, you know, maybe a little bit over the speed limit going down some country roads and people knew my car and my dad. And yeah, so maybe that wasn't so great. But in general, I really enjoyed growing up in Martins Ferry and in this small community. However, I can openly admit when I was a senior in high school trying to plan for what major I was going to pick, 
and what university I was going to go to for whatever major I picked, I have to say that, as Michaela mentioned, it did cross my mind that there wasn't as many opportunities in Martins Ferry or the Ohio Valley, for that matter, when you compared it to Columbus or Cleveland or Cincinnati or any large metropolitan area. And the options got even slimmer when I decided I wanted to go into engineering. I wanted to major in chemical engineering, where the closest actual chemical plant is one and a half to two hours away from that small area. So yeah, I do have to admit that I knew once I left high school, I wasn't probably going to come back to Martins Ferry, at least not in the near future. And again, I want to reiterate, it has nothing to do with the people there or the land itself. I really enjoyed growing up there. I mean, I challenged someone to find a better view in the whole world than going up to Riverview Cemetery, as weird as that sounds to have a good view from a cemetery, but it's true. If you go up to Riverview Cemetery in Martins Ferry in the fall or in the springtime when, every, when all the leaves come onto the trees, it is absolutely beautiful to stare down the upper portion of the Ohio Valley. But I digress. I do agree with Michaela in that I think a part of the solution is investing in young farmers or small farmers to promote locally grown food, but I think that's only a part of the solution. Another part could be that these small communities, these rural communities, could do maybe a better job of marketing themselves and what opportunities they do offer. Because not every person graduating from high school wants to be an engineer or wants to go be an investment banker. There are some that would like to go into agriculture, which is where I think these rural communities can really try and market themselves and try and attract the top talent from majors that revolve around agriculture. Now you may ask, okay, well, not every town has the money to go and do a big marketing campaign and recruit people from college, which I totally get. But I think a better way to try and market these rural communities is to start with high school students in their junior year by showing what opportunities are available to these students right in their backyard, so to speak. When I was a junior and senior in high school, I can't say that this was really done too much for me. The coal industry was starting to die, and what jobs were available, I didn't want to go into the coal industry. So it seemed like after that, there wasn't too many options. And this is when the shale, oil, and natural gas boom was just starting its upward trend back there. And I couldn't see myself going into that either. But outside of those two industries, I really didn't have an idea of what else was there to do. What was in downtown Wheeling, or Martins Ferry, or Steubenville, for that matter. I think myself and Michaela probably realized that any potential solution that you put out there, whatever attempt you make, it's not guaranteed that every high school student is going to come back to their small town. That's just not going to happen. But I do believe that you can get more young people to come back to rural communities, to their rural communities, or to another one, perhaps, by trying these solutions. Or maybe you have one of your own you could try. All I do know is that you miss every shot you don't take. So for anyone out there who is from rural communities, both in the past, present, or will be in the future, I think it's important to sit down and ask yourself right now, put yourself in the shoes of a high school student in their junior or senior year, and ask what would help you make the decision to come back to your rural community or to rural areas in general to be a part of the society there. I highly suggest that all of you listening take some time to listen to the Forgotten Rural America TEDx Talk by Michaela Bodie. I'll make sure to put the link in the video description on YouTube. We're going to go ahead and take a short break. When we come back, we're going to meet our panel and talk about the necessity of four-year college degrees and the rising cost of college tuition. Sit tight.
Okay, it's time to meet our panel. First up, from just south of the Ohio River, chemical engineer by day and avid Harry Potter enthusiast all the effing time, Allison Murner, welcome to the show. Hello, thanks. And then we have from the great Buckeye State, the man who should have invested in Stouffer's his freshman year of college, and look at this, another chemical engineer. Keaton Greeley, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Still better than ramen. But you know what, Keaton? Uh, I don't know. Uh, we could probably make a whole podcast about that. We could. <laughs> so We should. We should. Next you know what? what are yeah. you free tomorrow? Or Okay. Yeah, no, actually. Okay. <laughs> okay. In the monologue section or part of the show, so I talk about a TED talk that was done at Ohio State by a girl named Michaela Bodie. And so she talks, she mentions the rural brain drain, and it's about the forgotten rural, rural America. And she kind of talks about the top 10 to 20%, let's say, of graduating classes in rural areas of high school that go on to college to get an education they move away and then they don't return so they end up moving away and staying away and then you get this drain of of talent out of rural america that never comes back Um, and that leads to a lot of different things i don't want to go over all of it right now uh, for the sake of time but first question i want to ask you guys actually before that is how does it feel to ruin literally everything in the world as a millennial. How does that make you guys feel? Ugh, got used to it like 10 years ago. <laughs> I mean, I can't step out of the house without ruining a, 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 you know, an important industry. And by important, I mean important to my grandparents. Anyways, that's just to break the ice. <laughs> <laughs> but really, so first question, how could we promote the, these people, these kids graduating from high school in rural America, the top of their class, how could we promote, you know, these rural areas for them to come back to? What would incentivize them to come back, I guess, is the question. Feel free to jump in, anybody. Well, I guess I can start out a little bit. I am one of these people who have left my rural hometown and have not yet planned on going back. So I grew up in a town of 7,000 people, and now I am living in Louisville, Kentucky, definitely a little bit bigger <laughs> and, um, when there's more to do right yeah and so that's the thing is I mean there's there's both a lifestyle aspect but also there is definitely a financial aspect an economic aspect and there's a whole lot to this question and the more I right. sat down and kind of thought about it the more I realized like I, I don't really think there is a way for everyone to go back home you know right well yeah right exactly and it's not for everybody right I guess that question really is how how can you divert some yeah. How can you create opportunities or some nice things that would attract some people to come back home? Yeah. Any thoughts, Keaton? Yeah, I'm kind of on the other end of the spectrum. I I grew up in a town of, you know, 5,000, and I left, and now I'm back. But I think the, the biggest thing was, is, you know, here in my hometown, what I went to study for, I could go back to. And... So I, really, I so really, you were lucky then that you had yeah, opportunities to go to. That's the really the best way to describe it. I'm just lucky that I live in a town that has kind of a need for engineers. Right. Mm. A town that's not very big but still needs engineers. I, I kind of agree with Allison. I think that there's no way to get everybody to come back. There's no right. way to ever make them come back but i think maybe a good way to start is giving grants or something to college graduates i i feel at least what do you mean a lot of college graduates like as soon as you're done with college and maybe you find a job somewhere maybe the next thing you're thinking of is buying a house or buying a car maybe starting to make those big life investments you know yeah Investing maybe, in Ripple and well, in cryptocurrency too, or no? I'm just kidding. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> That's it. I'll take a drink for that. But um, I think kind of ahead. on that topic, I mean, at risk of like jumping ahead in the conversation to stuff that we're going to talk about later. Sure. You know, there there is a big a big uh, obstacle, I guess, to moving back to smaller towns is that 
smaller towns simply don't have a lot of the same resources that bigger cities have. So right. everyone's familiar with the concept that, right, millennials or whatever we're going to call our generation and even up to about 10 years older than us currently. Right. So in the 20s and 30s. Yeah, we're the, um, we're the edge of the millennials, right? I mean, 95 yeah. is like the cutoff, 96. Something oh, I don't like that. even know. Yeah, but we're on the, um, yeah, the edge. 96. But yeah, like it's, I'm going to lean towards saying it's actually uncommon to not have extreme debt when you graduate at this point. Um, Very true. And yeah. I don't know of a whole lot of people who were looking towards buying a home or buying new cars, stuff like that, when they got out of college. A lot of people, we still live in apartments or rent homes. Right. Using public transportation or at least having Ubers is a big deal. And then... Maybe that's just a cost of living thing that changes, though, because... You know, I, I'm, you know, now I do live in my small community mm -hmm. and I, I was able to buy a house, you know, okay. I, and I'm, I do have, you know, I'm not going to go into the details, but I do have a lot in student loans too. But I do think, you know, buying a house in Louisville is definitely yeah much different from buying a house in Little Elida, Ohio. Yeah. Well, actually that's, that's true. That's also, it also depends on where you're living too, right? If you're, if you're downtown in a big city, yeah, you're going to be paying a lot. But if you're on the outer edges, you know, I think it's might be, it might be more comparable ish, right? It's all dependent on the area that you live. Cause I know yeah, in terms of cost of living, I, I would have expected. So in Midland, Michigan, it's, if you look at the rankings, uh, I forget the scale, but, uh, it was Midland was an 80, 87.5 ish. And then Louisville was an 87.9 when I was just kind of Googling it. And it's mm. like, that's not what I would have expected at all. I would have expected, yeah. right, Louisville being, oh, I don't know how many times bigger, right? <laughs> you know, almost yeah. what at, at an order of magnitude at least bigger than, than Midland would be a lot more expensive. But mm -hmm. anyways, just food for thought. But yeah, I, I see what you're saying. Like, if anything, you would think the small town aspect would incentivize, like it being cheaper to live there would incentivize people straight out of college that are strapped with debt, which is averaging in the 30,000s now for students graduating from undergrad. And you'd think that would incentivize them more, but it's all like, it's all a prior, what's, what you're, what are you prioritizing? But mm -hmm. yeah, but to, to Allison's point though, she probably went to Louisville because there were jobs there. Yeah, I did move for a job, yeah. <laughs> You caught her, Keaton. You caught her. Yeah. <laughs> well, like I said, I moved back home, yep. and I was I was just fortunate enough that there was a job for me here. Right. Yeah. Where she's like she said, Louisville and big cities have those resources, and Louisville is a beautiful city. Yes, it is. You know, I can I can definitely see why. Like, yeah. It, it's it it's tough because you know, if I'm an engineer and I want to go back to my small town, but there's no places for engineers there. Mm -hmm. you, yeah, right. you can't. Right, exactly. You're kind of handcuffed to to that a little bit until you maybe change your career path a little bit later in life. If you switch from more of a technical track to a managerial track, but anyways, that's that's a different topic in general. Yeah, I, it's not an easy question to answer. It's something that I don't know if I'd be able to. I can't really. I'm in the same boat as you both. I, I can't really suggest a whole lot of options. Really, I mean, where I come from, in southeastern ohio which sounds more like tennessee from West some Virginia. of the accidents <laughs> well, okay keaton easy easy there well we went how many minutes without you mentioning west virginia so that's good that's actually a new record in martin's ferry right it's, it's about five thousand people too five to seven thousand so not too dissimilar from from where you both come from and it, it's exactly what you guys are saying it's just like there's not much to do right i mean i grew up my neighbors in the back were a couple of hay bales and on the other side of the road was a cornfield, actually multiple, right? And some cows over yonder. So it's like, that's not exactly appealing to me right now, right? Us being millennials, being in our 20s, being in our mid-20s, it's like, yeah, um, yeah, I'm good yeah. to be in a bigger yeah. area or at least or at least close enough to one, right, where there is something to do. Yeah, yeah. So I, I agree with that. Like, I can't. Columbus and Louisville and places like that are definitely much more entertaining than your small towns, right. especially if you have that kind of time in your 20s. Right. I mean, that goes without saying, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. To okay. be fair, though, this does kind of bypass the point. Like, I know it's in my personal plan. And then I know a lot of people tend to do this, right, is live downtown while you're younger, live 
right in the middle of everything. And then have families. Right. You do end up buying a house, and that's typically not downtown. So right. uh, maybe people so do they, end up moving farther out. That's true. And you know what? And I think maybe you know they're not looking at the. Um, maybe they're cutting off. You know how they're looking or in terms of age. So like maybe they should look a little bit further. So like looking full cycle, people are coming home. It's just not straight out of out of college. Yeah. That's the that's the thing. So, so I think this problem will fix itself later. I don't know. That's a good question. Uh, I kind I of mean, lean towards no, just because I would say no I mean, as well. You can you can even as you drive in in and around Louisville, you can see how the city has grown and grown and grown and grown. Well, yeah. And, and if you look at like urban populace, you know the percentage of people in the U.S. that live in cities. It's only oh, yeah. gone up. I mean, we're, we're talking 19, just before 1920, we crossed into over 50%. And now oh, wow. it's 80 as of 2010. So that's eight years ago. It's probably higher than that now. It, I didn't even know it was that high. Mm-hmm. So it's, I don't think it's going to get any better. I think there are only four states. Yeah, there are only four states that are less than 50% or that are not a majority. Hmm. So, okay. yeah, fun fact there for you. So let's, <laughs> let's move on to the other topic of the necessity of a four-year college degree because you know, I know from my own upbringing, right, it was never never in question that I was going to college, right? That was pretty much beaten into me, not physically, verbally by, by my wonderful mother. Mom, I love you. Um, <laughs> you. You know, that I was going to college. It never was explicitly stated like I'm going to a four-year college, but it was kind of implied. And so Mine it's... Was- your yours was physical. Is that what you're gonna say? <laughs> yeah, I was. Okay. Kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Yeah, we're gonna have to get Betsy on here. Can we call her in? <laughs> no. Uh, so, <laughs> you know, just I think about it, right? And then I, I've been reading articles that suggest that, and Keaton and I, Keaton, I've you know we've mentioned this before, is like the great. There's gonna be a great shortage of you know skilled jobs or jobs that. There is already a serious shortage. Right. Absolutely. Exactly. So I guess that's first question is like, so general thoughts on what your, what are your thoughts on the necessity of a four-year college degree? Feel free to talk to anybody. uh, I think it's extremely over-exaggerated. I think depending on your field, obviously, but I work at a petrochem plant and there are guys there that don't have college degrees, and they're doing way better than a lot of people I know with college degrees. And with that, they don't have the debt on top of it. Right, because it's a, it's a way quicker turnaround time, right? They go in, maybe it's a couple years, maybe not even that, and then they go into the workforce. Yeah, and, and it's a, it's a high-paying job. A lot of these trade jobs are. Yep. I fully agree with everything you just said. I mean, I'm also in the chemical industry. We're a manufacturing plant. And I mean, there are engineers out there, there are plenty of them, but we are always actively looking for skilled operators, skilled maintenance, electricians, pipe fitters, welders, and we cannot get enough of them no matter how hard we try. Right. Yeah. I I believe the union, the Millwright union in my plant or in our facility had six people apply for the apprenticeship program and only two actually show up. Yeah. Holy crap. That's a crisis because we're having... Within the next five years, we're going to have maybe 10 or 15 millwrights retire, and we aren't going to be able to replace them. Yep. Right. That's, yeah, that's actually completely true. That especially with the technical, I guess, education and skilled labor, it's a very old population. Like, they're much closer to retiring age than starting age as a whole. Right. That's- and it kind of does make you worry a little, when, especially when you're sitting in a plant realizing, well, a good, like, 30, 40% of my maintenance support is going to retire in the next five years and we are just now bringing new ones on right yeah Um, yeah so i mean i guess i guess is there is there a way that people could be better funneled from high school through whatever program into these jobs is it something that the high schools should be doing a better job at preparing people for and before uh you guys chime in real quick I I remember from my own experience that, so we had in Belmont County and Jefferson County, which is just north, we had so what we called career technical centers or what we called uh, joint vocational schools where, you know, instead of 
going to your traditional high school classes for your junior and senior year, you could go and learn a trade and still get your high school degree and then also have a certificate and could go into, let's say, you wanted to be a mechanic, right? You could go and do that in high school and then go straight into the workforce. Uh, but, yeah. not, but not a lot of people chose that option, mainly because there was such a negative stigma with the types of kids that went out there, right? The people were like, no, I don't want to go out there with those type of kids. Yeah, you know, we definitely had that. And, you know, going through high school. So I think I think that option became available to go to the tech. We had the same thing. It was like a high school, like early tech school kind of yeah. uh, program. And I think they would bust them out for half of a day and you would do it for like a semester or something. Yeah. Um, but yeah, at your freshman and sophomore years, you were never pushed towards that. It was always AP classes, advanced classes, get your right, advanced right, right. education. Right. You want to be working people, towards those. Yep, which yeah. is pushing people more towards your, your traditional four-year degree. Mm. Yep, exactly. Yeah. We, I do not remember ever being told, and maybe this was because I did, I did go in the AP track, but we were not really shown options for technical school at all. It was always four-year degrees. Yep. Or more. Same way. Same exact way. Yep. And I mean, I do think if you can teach basic skills in high school, set them up to build that interest and then also give them a heads up or I mean, a leg up, I guess, on that training, you can have skilled workers coming out one or two years after high school and being fully ready to be apprentices and get their certifications to be out there working. Like. Right. I mean, that's, I, I, that's still education. Oh, yeah. I, I and feel like a lot of people say, oh, yeah, you want to go It's a very get... highly valued education. Right. But it's not like... at the time by the people who are, I guess, pushing the options. Right. Yeah. I I think I, I put it on the high schools, honestly, because mine was the same way. There is a negative stigma about going there. And despite there being some very smart people that went there, and now they're doing great. I, I put it on the high schools. I think... High schools always talk about we've sent this many kids to college. Right. They never talk about how many can nope. go to college and drop out. Right. And they never talk about how many kids go on to get jobs or go on to trade school. It's right. You need to mm-hmm. you need to broaden the college. scope, right, of the metric. Yeah. Yeah. Or how many kids are employed five right. years later. It's like trying to judge like how well the U.S. economy is doing just by looking at the the Dow, right, or the Nasdaq or something. It's like, oh, the Dow's down. How many percentage points? But it's like it doesn't really matter you you have to look at other things to assess how well the the economy is doing not just one number yeah and i think you got to make it clear too that though there's those threats of technology replacing jobs i don't i don't think you're ever going to replace your millwrights or your pipe fitters or your technicians like i i don't see how those hard worker the hard work the ones who get in there and get it done i don't see how you replace those at least not in the near, near future. Sure. Well, it does seem like we are saying, like, yeah, we should push people more towards these type of roles. And, yeah, there is a shortage right now. But is it something that pushing people into something where by the time they finish, their job's not going to be there because of technology coming in? And I mean, them? how are you? Okay, so operations, like, there is a lot of automation and artificial intelligence work going into operations. I well, don't. In most cases, that's safer. Yes. And especially with, honestly, look back 10, 20, 50 years ago, plants had a lot more people working in them, but they were also significantly ha- more hazardous places to work. Yep. So, yeah, a lot of automation is a drive to safety. The nature of welding and electrician work and uh, pipe fitters, all this stuff, that's very unique to each project. Right, and yes. that's very true. I, I don't, granted, there's probably teams out there working on this that I just can't comprehend the kind of scope that they're working with, but I don't see how that can be automated I don't or know. done without people. Right. Yeah, there's some things where it's never going to be able to, to replace, right? But Yep. But <laughs> At least... I, I do operations, I think, that way is definitely heading more and more towards automation. Yeah. I, I think, unfortunately... Right. Yeah, gonna- and I still fully believe that we're going to need people out there, but definitely to a lesser extent. Right. Yeah. I guess the one thing, if I'm being devil's advocate here, right, let's say I'm CEO of a company, I'm looking at my balance sheet and I'm like, 
uh, I don't have to pay an automated valve disability. I don't have Ugh. to offer any health care, That's... right? Yeah, that is true. It's a very it's a very negative way of looking at it, but CEOs, I would say for some companies more so than others have a they're able to I don't know, objectively look at it, I guess would be the more correct term even though it's kind of a really crappy way of But also when you it. say that, that doesn't you didn't mention the cost of programming the automation. Programming. That's true. Taking doing the regular maintenance, just the the regular annual maintenance or whatever it is on that valve as well as the True. sensing mechanisms that people control for. it. Yep. It doesn't yeah. take into account the fact that you're going to need programming changes as you automate more and more or change right. your processes. And then it doesn't right. account for any failures at all. And right. those are very expensive. Yeah, that's a good point. So maybe it's creating, maybe it is, you know, you create jobs, you just, maybe you destroy two, but create one, right? You have, you need more people to maintenance stuff as you automate more potentially. Yeah. But is that still good? Oh yeah, I mean, yeah, that's a it's a good question. I don't have the answer to that. Yeah. yeah, whether it's good or not, though, if it is financially beneficial, it's going yeah. to happen. Yeah. Oh so, yeah, for sure. We're not moving away from yeah. it. Yeah. I mean, these are businesses. Yep. Their purpose is to make money, so yep. that's what they do. <laughs> yep. But in the long run, if everything becomes automated and you have so many people that just don't have jobs, is it profitable? Yeah. I so. Mean, I that think you kind need of to actually look at a balance into, sheet to to see that, but I mean, even assuming even assuming that is what's going to happen or something, you know, hundred years from now, five hundred years, whatever we're talking about. Right, when we're um, dust in the in the ground, yes. Yeah, <laughs> everyone always talks about what are we going to do when we lose these jobs, but honestly, it's going to be a lot more than that because that is an entire cultural change, you know, like with loss of, you know, maybe the skilled labor jobs like we've talked about. Right. There's going to have to inherently be more higher level jobs such as programming stuff like that and then i guess also more people getting the higher education but then there's also going to be simply more people left out so there's going to have to be changes to our government budgeting systems there's going to be changes to our social systems our education systems all together you know right it's yeah. not just going to be the same way that it is now no right. it can't but we're and i mean yeah, go ahead. It's, it's really hard to talk about such an abstract idea of right. this weird future that's a different world. Yeah. yeah. Right. And, you know, I think if we want to touch on the other side of things, too, we're kind of focusing on is a four-year college degree necessary? So if we look at the areas where it is necessary, maybe not four-year, but if you look at it right, I mean, back in like World War II era, you had like 15% of people in high school went on to higher education, right? And then that that goes up to today, basically 60% of all the jobs in the United States require some form of higher education. That's only increasing, right? I mean, the GED or a high school diploma without anything other than that is not getting you very much today. No. I guess, I guess apprenticeships and on-the-job training used to be a lot more important than it is now, but that's because two-year technical degrees have taken that, that spot. You know? Right. But... Do you think maybe there are just a lot of occupations out there that don't necessarily need to have a college degree associated with it? Yeah, I mean, if you're wanting to apply for a job, right, and you see these are the required things and these are the preferred things, right? And it's like, okay, is a, is a PhD really necessary to be, you know, the manager of this McDonald's? Like, is that really required or can we can we put that in the preferred maybe? You know, it's right. just kind of looking at the how you're terming things and it's like, yeah, is – is a four-year degree really necessary for this? I think that depends on the company for sure and how how highly they think of themselves too. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, I, I think engineering, I, I would definitely think you would always want that to be have a college degree associated with it. No, and, no, I don't, mm -mm. <laughs> no. I don't think so. Nope. No, Joe off the street, he could probably do it. <laughs> yeah, right. jo Joe, yeah, Jim, probably not. Joe, yeah, I know Joe. He's a great guy. Yeah. Although yeah. we are, goes to my so church, all actually, three of us, oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. So all, all three of us are inside of that industry, though. So and I think people would probably tend to overestimate, yeah. maybe. Yeah, I think yeah. that needs yeah, yeah. I mean, we're well, engineers, I mean, so it's like, well, yeah, of course you need a, a degree, right? But, <laughs> but, but, I, I don't know. I think it would be hard without. Oh, yeah, for sure. I, I wouldn't want my surgeon. Oh, no. Of not having, <laughs> the guy who's going to cut me open to knife had to go to med school. 
Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Let's definitely keep all the schooling for that. That would make it would yeah. make some interesting scars though, would it not? Would it <laughs> Yes it would. Yes it would. I I just think obviously there are some degrees and there's some occupations that you definitely should go and study for and improve your knowledge of those subjects, but I do think there is a large number of degrees in college where one, there's not a job for it, and two, on the job training would probably suffice you just as much. Yeah. Yeah. I also want to point out, and also doing some some research, it was forecasted that this year by a guy named Tony, oh, I'm going to butcher this, Carnivale, projected that the U.S. would need at least 22 million more people to have college degrees to meet the demand for the, those education requirements for the jobs. So hmm. this year, it's projected that we need 22 million more people. So why, you know, why do we have such a shortage? I think that's also, you know, a very broad question that has probably a lot of different factors contributing to that shortage. It's interesting. To, so as a whole, if you look at jobs requiring education, we're, we're technically at a shortage right now. In addition to just looking at the the skilled or uh, trade related jobs, where you right. need a four year degree, right? Uh, we can move on to something that's near and dear to me, and this is where do I have? Uh, I don't know if I have the sound effect to uh, to bleep myself, so you guys might have you guys might have to hear some sailor language. But we're gonna move on to the cost of college tuition and how that has seemed to have really risen dramatically from recent past to when our parents went to school. I wasn't able to uh, to contact the Madre in time for this. I'd have to imagine that uh, tuition was pretty cheap back in, in her day. Don't want to date you, Mom. Don't worry. You're not you're young at heart, Mom. I love you again. So, number one, babe. She's number one. She, numero un, Madre. Love you. If Travis wasn't beaten before, he's so sure he's about to be now. <laughs> oh, yeah. I'm cut off, man. <laughs> Bye-bye car insurance. <laughs> so just looking at, but I do have something. So for 19, in the ni- late 1980s, at public four-year institutions, the average just tuition, so not counting the other uh, nickel and dime kind of fees and room and board, it was $3,200 basically in 1987-1988 school year. So that's it. And that's adjusted to today's dollars wow so that's how much it costs but so looking at 30 years later though now it's the average is nine basic almost a 10 grand for the 2017 2018 school year also from cnbc that's 213 percent increase is that so is that just tuition or is that including just tuition no that's just tuition so the cost of just going and sitting in a classroom, you're not, you know, we're not, we're not, yes, for the school year. Now, so do you know, is that, semesters. is that a, the 87 number, is that in 1987 dollars? No, or that's, dollars? no, that's today's, that's adjusted for today's okay. dollars. Then, yeah. So Which I'm looking is, at one that it has the same data, but it's the total tuition, fees, room and board for both. It has listings for public, private. All sorts of different things. Four year, two year, all this, yep. and yeah, similar numbers or similar ranges of numbers. But yeah, it goes from uh, seven thousand eight hundred back in nineteen eighty six to today. It's in, and that's in today's dollars. And in two thousand fifteen and sixteen, it was seventeen thousand. So yeah, right. there's a ten thousand dollar per year increase. Just looking at Harvard alone in nineteen eighty eight. Just looking at senior year, two semesters, you would have spent seventeen grand on tuition Mm -hmm. in 1988 that is in today's dollars compared to now that is forty five thousand dollars oh like oh my god so that's some of the numbers i guess the first thing is you know looking at i don't know if you're if you know what your parents paid but just looking at that right so our parents paid a lot less than we did just looking at tuition and everything else right room and board all that stuff I think a lot factors into that. I think it depends on probably what administration is uh, in the Oval Office, let's say, on how much funding is going to those public institutions, right? So, I mean, that's one thing that people tend to attribute to the, the drastic rise in tuition, or at least one factor of it is the cuts that have come to the, the money, the funding that is coming to these public universities. 
That's... I, I actually have some numbers to, to bust yeah, go, that. Yeah, go ahead. Tax dollars given to higher education per Time Magazine. It was five dollars and twenty-eight cents per one thousand dollars in taxes in twenty fourteen. If a person paid a thousand dollars in taxes, only five dollars and twenty-eight went to higher education. Where in, in nineteen ninety, it was seven dollars and sixteen cents per a thousand dollars. However, Time Magazine made a very good point that if you're the government and all of a sudden this this higher education just multiplies rapidly and has many more kids coming and many more sources of income coming, then why do you have to give them as much money? Compared to 1990, there are many, many, many more kids going to higher education. And so Time Magazine at least believed that because many more people were going to higher education, many more sources of income for that higher education, they brought the number of tax dollars given to higher education right. down. Right. You know what, which may be true, but it's also more people are going to college. This is not me spitting at you, Keaton, so much as just the article. No. So, yeah, there's more people going to college and colleges are, are and universities are getting more money, but how are they getting that money? I think you also have to look at the way in which or the ease of getting a, a loan now, like student loans. The ease that has gotten incredibly easier from federal government, making it more available to students. I think that's also a reason why colleges, it's not just that more people are going, it's also because they they are going because they're getting loans. They're getting, at least from the federal, you know, subsidized loans, it's cheaper interest rates than if you're getting them from Discover. And they use that as like, oh, we have more people here. So yeah, let's raise the tuition. And then you, you set up this feedback loop where, because you have more people coming in, they're spending more, in loans, which gets the universities more money, they, you know, and it cycles through. And then people come out with more debt, and then you go back and you, oh, okay, we're getting more people still, so raise raise tuition. Yeah, well, I mean, the, the demand is there. They can keep re- raising the prices, and people are still going to go. Yep, mm-hmm. I mean, it's true, especially yeah. if it's required by jobs, right? I mean, if you need a degree, yeah. you there's no ifs, ands, or buts. You, you got to go right. in some form or another. If you're a business and your customers just keep coming – Regardless of you raising the price, why would you stop raising your prices? Yep, exactly. If you think about somebody where if you if you don't want to supply something, right, a strategy is like, well, I'll just raise the price. Like, if we don't want to make this, let's just keep raising the price, and then they won't pay for it. But if you keep raising the price and the people keep paying it, you're exactly right, Keaton. There's no, there's no disincentive for raising the price. Right. There's not. And I mean... I just think it, that... It's a norm yeah. now. Well, I mean, yeah, that's the problem is that college debt is like, that's just a thing. It's normalized mm-hmm. now. Go ahead. I don't think it's un- I don't think it's unfair either. Like you no. are you are paying for a good amount of work and effort that is being put into you and you are going to come out with an advantage in the workforce over right. people who didn't go to college. Like I, yep. I do think that's fair, but it has changed. And again, that's it's just a lot of things that have to change along with it to make that possible and I don't think those changes are really occurring as they need to. I mean, what what changes would you would you say? Well, I mean, it's just like the I mean, after graduation, we've already kind of talked about how people don't always go out buy houses. They don't have children as early. They don't get married, buy cars, all this stuff. And it's because there is a lot more debt out there. And no right. matter how you really look at it, like for no matter what, I guess, reasons you put behind it, when a big portion of the population is in debt, there's going to be less spending or more economic trouble. You know, right. depending on if they are spending or not, you know? Right. It, well, yeah, and that's what kind of makes me question, like, if you want people to go out and spend and create, like, a good economy where you have lots of GDP growth, why would you strap people? Why would you, why isn't more being done to reduce the amount of debt that people are carrying is my thing, right? Because right. you get out and right. you have all this debt and it's like, you really can't fully contribute to the economy because you're playing catch up to try and, to try and pay off all that debt. Before you can even like actually go out and, and buy things, maybe that's. Let me ask. You, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. If let's 2008, we went to uh, the Great Recession, right? Yeah, we did. It's been 10 years. Another recession is looming. Oh, it's gonna happen. It, it should have happened already. Very if you soon. if you look at the timing. And maybe that might be just what we need to bring down these college prices. Another recession where. Well, now people really aren't spending money because of a recession, 
and they are strapped with these student loans on top of it. My hope, at least, is when this other recession comes, maybe loan forgiveness becomes much more of a thing. Not maybe your entirety of the loan, but a good cut of it to allow you to go out and help contribute to rebuilding the economy. How can I help this economy grow if I'm spending however much money, a large percentage of my paycheck, a quarter of my paycheck at least, on student loans? And, and for some people, they can handle it a lot better than others. Some people are getting the loans because they have to get the degree. And then let's say they don't get a job or they're delayed in getting a job or they get a job that doesn't pay as much as you were expecting to. And then you're right. in a world of hurt. And it, and it doesn't help things that just recently the Department of Education, like just this past week, uh, said they were going to cut $13 billion in relief for like student loan forgiveness, basically, which is just insane. I I, yeah. I can't believe they could do that, honestly. It just seems like there's a lot of predators out there for, for students now, which kind of sucks. Now, can I defend the colleges real quick, though? Yeah, go ahead. You know, No, I, no, you can't oh. give us your honest opinion. <laughs> They're evil. Yeah. They're yeah. evil. Go ahead. Colleges are evil. Well, I think, too, I'm this university, and back in 1980, I probably didn't have near as many students, right? Okay. You probably didn't now, have near as much as many majors too, right? I mean, the amount of majors has definitely increased since then. Right. Well, it was like you could York, be a farmer, or yeah, that's it. For, but yeah, for, <laughs> New York Times says between 1975 and 2008, actual teachers in universities, like let's say there's 11,000 teachers in a major university, part time or full time, that, that number didn't change much. However, administ the administration grew by an average of 8,000. So yeah. the university has a lot more kids they have to have at their university. They need a much larger staff to pay. So then they would they would have to raise prices, I would think. Well, yeah. I do see that, but I, I also, I guess I don't necessarily see why the price would be raising so much when the student population is also rising. I right. agree with that. And, and I think that, so coming back to the point that was made on demand still being high, there's articles out there that also suggest that colleges are using higher tuition as a way to selectively recruit people, individuals. So it's like, oh, well, we're going to charge this. And these they were, they're expecting a certain percentage to not be able to pay full sticker price. And so they're like, oh, well, if we want this specific type of person, let's say, with an ACT score of whatever, you know, whatever background they want to make up the proper diversity at their university, they can offer them scholarships, right, or more so than others. Right. There are articles um, that suggest yeah. that that's another way that that's why tuition keeps rising is because they know some people are going to be able to afford that full sticker. Jay Schottenstein yeah. at Ohio State specifically, his kids are fine. Like, you know, they're driving effing Lambos and parking by the shoe, okay? Right. So they're fine. They're doing fine. They're going to be able to afford it no matter what. Can we validate university presidents making seven-figure salaries, seven-plus-figure salaries? Well, yeah. And then, well, okay, okay, so not just university presidents. What about, I'm probably going to get some backlash for this, but what about uh, college football coaches maybe? Mm -hmm. For Ohio State, that's fine. And U of M and big football programs, it's okay because they, at Ohio State, I know for a fact, uh, looking at 2015, 2016, the athletics as a whole, they generated enough money through ticket sales to completely pay for their athletic program. So they didn't need to supplement the money they were spending on athletics by raising tuition on just your general students that didn't participate in athletics. You know, Ohio State didn't ra isn't raising tuition because it has to pay for its athletic program. Right, that's, that's not. That's correct. That's what I'm saying. They are not raising their tuition. But other, okay. if you look at other probably smaller colleges that have still a, a decent amount of sports that they offer than their athletic departments, they're not all as big name, right? They're not all selling out stadiums. So right. some colleges, I have to imagine, are raising their tuition or it's probably not tuition so much as well, this fee or that fee or whatever to pay for things or, yeah. to, or to subsidize or make up the money that they're not bringing in from the athletics. And this topic is something that I wish we had some like budgetary breakdowns, maybe even just of our own right. colleges or something. Correct. Um, that would be really interesting to see. But I do think 
So not knowing the numbers behind it, but just having visually seen it myself, one thing that has definitely changed, even from, when was I in college, right? 2012 through 2016? <laughs> that was a long ago. time ago. <laughs> yeah. Well, back when we so, had a tolerance for alcohol. <laughs> yeah. Way back when. It's gone. Um, <laughs> but between the start of 2012 when I was there and the end of 2016, campus housing did a complete 180. Right, because it's so, super nice now. Like, it's un, oh it's ungodly God. nice. Well, like, the whole university. Just one thing I noticed at UK, first of all. So, my sister was starting there as I was leaving. And when she started there, she the dorm that I was in as a freshman was the newest one at the time. It is now the oldest dorm four years later. So, wow. there's been that much of a turnaround. First world problem. Um, also, so... It is now standard for dorm rooms to have maximum four I guess, students sharing a bathroom. Not the case when I started. It was... Did you say maximum you know, of four? Yes. So they're in like the suite style living yeah. where Ke- it's... Keaton, that four sound familiar, bro? <laughs> yeah. Four dudes for 300 square feet. You can make another <laughs> podcast just on that. In fact, we should. Oh you're free, are you free tomorrow? I'm just yeah. I'm, right. I'm... <laughs> Sorry. Continue, I'm... Allison. Sweet style. Oh, I'm just saying like it's it's gone from like... You know, when you think of the traditional college dorm, it was 20 people in a hallway, one big bathroom. Yep. Your mm-hmm. room was Bring your two shower bunk bed shoes because you don't know desks. what those drains were like. Yep. Um, now they have tempur mattresses in each of the dorms, a right. clean bed in their what? room. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. And honestly, I think a big part of this, granted, I am, is it like anthropology that studies like people and cultures and stuff? Yeah. yeah. I'm no anthropologist, but I do think. Thank you for being honest. <laughs> Thanks. Personally, I think social media is a big deal with that because, I mean, that's what people see. Like, you know, every college student posts their pictures, right. their new dorm with all their right. cute little decorations, their big room. And it's all very visual. Like, it's all looks. And when it right. when your students walk in and see this great place they're going right, to be living. Right, exactly. It's a way to recruit more yeah, people. Yeah, they're right? willing to pay 4000 more than the people yep. did four years ago exactly. or two years ago. And then it's a race to the top. And all these colleges are then competing yep. with that. So everybody has to build all new dorms and exactly what you're saying queen size beds or the best dining halls and all this stuff and this was happening to keaton and i when we were at ohio state was all these smaller three floor dorms they were like okay well we're going to require freshmen and sophomores to live on campus and so we're just going to completely revamp them and it was yep nice like oh they're like hotels yeah Mm -hmm. really nice hotels where is that shit freshman year we were in grungy whatever yeah but i digress my yeah. thing though is i personally would have been willing to live in the older style less fancy ones if it would have meant a five thousand dollar cut to my tuition cost oh that, exactly but they aren't even given that option i feel nope those, nope. those dorms are long gone but nope it's high life now when you're in college yeah which is like you're in college like you're there you're there to get a degree i mean i don't know it it makes you a i don't know i'd say a tougher person i don't know i mean living with four dudes freshman year like I love you, Keaton, but damn, it was not. Yeah. It was not the nicest, and I'm sure anybody can probably it would no, echo man. that. And it teaches you important life skills. Like you're not going to get along with everybody in life. Like you're going to have to deal yeah. with people, and it. I think it really helped me. So. Oh like, yeah, I, I, don't I mean, agree. Like if I had I a mean, queen my- bed, like what does that teach me? I just become. <laughs> I just become this snotty person who's like, um, I need a queen <laughs> bed. <laughs> I need a queen. Oh my bed. god. And, you know, but what? Uh, what is that after? Right. Yeah. Like, what is? What are we? What, you, what are we teaching you, our kids? <laughs> and you can't afford that. You don't right. have a job. You can't afford that queen bed that you yeah. had to offer college. Well, and there's there's a really good uh, podcast out there called The Revisionist History with Malcolm Gladwell. So it's on iTunes, and he talks about in one of his episodes. It's called uh, Food Fight, and it talks about these two colleges. One in I believe it's Maine, and the other one is in New York, and they're smaller colleges. And they, they talk about the difference in food. Like you think of it being kind of small, but this one, the college in Maine has gourmet food, but the money that they spend extra to make the food good, they have less to give to poorer students. So they're taking in less students overall. So the less fortunate kids, smart kids are not getting as much help there than if you look at the the University of New York, where mm. their food sucks. It would, uh, I would equate it to NoCo, Keaton. NoCo, NoCo breakfast. You know how bad that was. That was so burritos. 
<laughs> burritos, burritos, no chase. You know, yeah. it's it's looking at that, and but they, for them, they are one of the top ones in the nation for giving money to less for you know people who are poor, poorer students who couldn't afford to go there otherwise. And the amount of people coming there, I think it's like twenty three percent of their student body mm. is lower income like low students. Income, yeah. yeah. Which is, it's something I wouldn't have originally thought about. What's the trade-off for having nice food, having these nice dorms? Jeez. Right? It's just, just eye-opening. Just food. Just right? Just food. just food. That's not even wow. that's not even looking at all the new dorms and new workout facilities and, and, mm-hmm. and, and. Yeah. You Don't know, get but, me wrong. I think they're really nice. I like yeah. having nice food. I like having good yeah. dorms. I, I just, exactly. I also like having money to survive. Right. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. I mean, Wendy's made a four for four deal for a reason. Get you <laughs> when you're in college, you get the bare minimum food plan, and you use your, use your Buckeye cash, Keaton. Go to High Street and get yourself four for four. Yep. No Robin need to eat days. that slop at the, uh, at the all you can eat buffet style dineries. With, por- porcelain plates. Yeah, porcelain. That's, no, I think that's that being actually that was, generous. That was not porcelain. I agree with Allison 100%. It's wonderful to have those nice things, but if it drives it drives the cost up to the point where after you graduate, it makes it hard for you to survive. Like if you look back and you graduate and you're like, oh my God, this is how much debt I'm going to have to pay in <laughs> six months or start paying in six months. Yeah, yeah I would have been okay with shittier food and... Uh, Maybe a, a twin size bed. Yeah. Yep. But as an eighteen year old, how do you know? Right, you don't. You have no idea. Yeah. Well and, and as an eighteen year old too, you also assume you're gonna walk out with a job. Yeah, that's yeah. true, right? You walk well, in there. It doesn't always happen. No, it does not. So kind of shifting gears a little bit on getting an opinion on so what you hear from mainly the left side of the political spectrum. The more liberal people, uh, progressives, I guess, is if you want to brand them as something, you hear Bernie Sanders talk about this a lot, is making public colleges tuition-free. So basically trying to bring the European model or what they do in, you know, in EU here. So what, what are your thoughts uh, on that? Uh, so- I'm, I'm not for it. I, I would, if you're going to make that large a financial investment, I would rather there just be a uh, universal income those people who graduated college can use whatever they're given for that universal income to help pay their debt i think you solve more problems with that than just making college free and i think if you make college free as well then that opens a whole floodgate of more people going to college and that won't fix our skilled jobs and that's exactly right. what we talked about for the first like 30 right. minutes of right. our conversation yeah i'll say too i i mean i am definitely left of center but i think looking at just free college is only looking at one little piece of a very big puzzle right. yes yep very true maybe if it could encompass some more like other certifications trainings stuff like that like yeah everyone who comes out of high school they need everyone needs to be able to work that's how people make a living yeah and if there were just a wider variety of options, right. then I would support that being made free or sponsored by government funding. But So continue if I, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, no, no. I was basically done. Okay. So, I mean, my thoughts on this are, yeah, I'm more left of center as well. And for me, I don't know. I've thought about this before. And it's like, it is, I mean, it sounds like a good idea. In theory, you would have to obviously levy a tax on everyone to raise the money. Mm -hmm. to get that to pay for that and you know i can i can make an argument for why i would think that 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 would be a good thing for probably two-year degrees and certificates and stuff like that just because i think students i came in and i changed my major people come in all the time and change their major and then you're okay so you're paying for people to go to the college for free and if they take eight years what's like that's a lot of money, you know, that you would be paying for someone to figure out what the hell they want to do. And mm-hmm. So yeah. it's like, which again, you can, you can, that spider webs and everything like, why can't high schools do a better job of, you know? You, okay. So you can look yeah. at that too, but just kind of coming back and it's like, okay, for a two year degree, I think it's potentially worth levying a tax and saying, look, everybody, you can get a, you can get an associate's degree and you have that degree. But if, if you want anything more than that, I think there needs to be some still you know, like Pell Grants available for low-income people and, and scholarship money available. But I, I honestly don't think that there is anything wrong with having some skin in the game. Yeah, having, having Putting some of your own money towards something because you have more of a, an appreciation for it. I liken that to 
when I got my first car when I was 16. My parents didn't pay everything for that. I had to I had to take out money and pay for a chunk of that too. And, and it made me have an appreciation for my car. It's like, well, I'm not going to just drive this thing off a cliff because I uh, got some money in it. Yeah. It's a little it, bit drastic. But if everything's just given to you, then you, you don't have as much of an appreciation for it. I don't think you should make people go into thirty thousand dollars in debt or more but at the same time i think you should have some skin in the game so i would yeah. i would lean on the side of no i don't think we should make everything tuition free but at the same time i think I, kind of like you were saying like universal income okay so why can't we just let's just hey let's put more money into education so we have more scholarships to get people yeah boom yep. oh my god brain exploded yeah i mean there, there's no reason why coming out of school you're basically paying a house payment or your student loans, basically paying a house payment. And why does it have to be that way? If we give more money to education, then maybe maybe the prices would be better. But at the same time, universities are businesses, and if the customers keep coming as you raise the prices, yep. why would you stop? Yep, it is, it is very true. Any other closing thoughts? No, thanks for having me. Yeah, yeah. that was a pretty interesting conversation. Ed. What an interesting the directions we ended up going in. Yeah, I think we have, we definitely have some room to go. We need, something needs to happen. So yeah, yeah it was good to at least talk through it. And yeah, obviously we're not going to solve every problem, just us three. That'd be nice, but they would have to pay us a lot more. They can do that. I'd be down. Oh yeah. yeah. I mean, I would not turn it down. I would not turn that down at all. <laughs> Help me pay some of that student loan debt. So thank you both. So we're talking about intense kind of stuff kind of dry sometimes spitting out a lot of numbers and i want to try and at the end of the show lighten the mood a little bit kind of get everybody to kind of relax a little bit maybe have a couple chuckles so this week on episode two we're going to try something first time first segment so i named it trav's travesties oh gosh you heard, oh, no. it, you heard it here first the whole premise is uh trying of taking some of uh, the recent news headlines that just make you go like are you kidding me <laughs> like what and just you know lighten the mood a little bit getting a little laugh potentially here it goes Trav's travesties first up this week it was reported that a colombian german shepherd named sombra had a seventy thousand dollar bounty on her head because oh. of how good she is at smelling cocaine <laughs> <laughs> when the reporters asked her for a comment she stated that only a bitch would offer less than 100k <laughs> And I know about bitches. Oh my god, <laughs> Travis, go back to your day job. Second, <laughs> next up, uh, I was in the Guardian this past week that Kristen Stewart of Twilight fame, if you want to call that fame, has been casted as one of the lead angels in the upcoming reboot of Charlie's Angels. And to that, I say, what? <laughs> Come on, casting Kristen Stewart as in Charlie's biggest, Angels. My biggest issue is just the breathing. It... There's so much breathing anytime she's involved. <laughs> well, to that, it's to... like this horrible. It is. Guys, I'm doing a bit here. <laughs> <laughs> so my response is, come on, casting Kristen Stewart in Charlie's Angels makes about as much sense as casting Charlie Sheen in The Wizard of Oz. Oh my gosh. As Dorothy. <laughs> uh, I don't know. I might pay to see that. Watch... <laughs> No, they say it that. a couple of beers. All right, scratch. I'm, rewrit I'm rewriting that joke. I'm rewriting that. We're gonna <laughs> it. Okay. No, we're going to leave it. But I, I, you know what? Now that you say that, if it was a live play, oh, yeah. Honestly. I would go to that. Especially if he was just like normal him, like drugged out of his mind self. <laughs> Hashtag winning. Tiger blood. Tiger blood. Tough day <laughs> for the trolls. So third up, shortly after the White House banned a CNN reporter from attending a press event, Advisor Kellyanne Conway berated the news media, saying that they should show some more civility and respect, quote-unquote. Uh, well, if no one thinks that's ironic, then you might be Kellyanne Conway. I have a deal for Kellyanne Conway. Well, when the White House starts to uh, respect the press a little more, then I'll start respecting the MRI scans that show that she actually has a brain. Uh, me. 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 Wait, I think that actually calls for a... <laughs> Time out, Trav. Time out. Okay, so last week it was announced that uh, 22 people would get the opportunity to hunt a grizzly bear. And I don't know if I'm the only one who thinks this, but I think it's a little insane that people call this a sport when one team has no effing clue that the game is going on. Maybe if you're so hungry that you feel the urge to go hunt a bear, why not just, you know, have Amazon drone drop some steaks off at your house? Just that, a, that's the just only a suggestion. Reason. That's the only reason they're hunting this bear? They're hungry? 
I mean, that, no, it's a question. I'm just asking a question, Keaton. Ah. Okay. I'm not insinuating here, man. I just asked the questions. I like, I like bears. Don't shoot the bear. That's what I'm saying. Don't, like bear. don't shoot the oh, bear. bear. Don't shoot Smokey. He you warns know. us about forest fires. Why can you shoot him? And we got a lot of forest fires now. Come on. You gonna shoot Smokey? Why? Why? Why you gonna, you, you gonna smoke Smokey like that? <laughs> smoke Smokey. All right, next. Mo moving on. Current Secretary of Education, Betsy DeVos, and Allison, you will like this one. Best known for her oh, portrayal boy. of Dolores Fair Umbridge <laughs> in the Harry Potter films. Uh, uh, had to deal with some first world problems recently. Her $40 million luxury yacht was set adrift in Lake Huron, where it then crashed into a dock, which caused $10,000 in damages. Public school board members were heard saying, where are her other nine yachts? <laughs> <laughs> also, uh, did they not teach her that in boating school? Right, because she went and... to school. Yep. Uh, no, they don't teach that at charter schools. Actually. No, I, I, no I that's exactly what they teach in charter schools, right? Yeah, right, boating. <laughs> actually, you know what? Yeah. They might especially, actually do that. Especially Michigan ones. <laughs> <laughs> that's very true. Very true, Allison. Very valid point. Do you want to take over? Uh, you do a great job. <laughs> Okay, lastly, oh, last man. one. You don't want to hear the things I'll come up with for her. No, I do, because they can't be any worse than my shit. <laughs> okay, so lastly, you may have heard, uh, well, actually, Allison, this might be relevant to you. Papa John's founder and conference call. Harry Potter? Oh, that is relevant, actually. <laughs> Allison, I'm doing a bit here. <laughs> So Papa John's founder and conference call N-word user, John Schnatter, is reportedly suing Papa John's over an in an uh, internal documents request. Some believe this is in response to the company pressuring him to step down as chairman. The company said that they believe they are in the right since he left a bad taste in their mouths. You know, <laughs> like their pizza. Okay, so hey, that's that's Trav's, Trav's travesties. I like Adi it. Edition one. I like the edition. We'll yeah. keep working. We'll work. We'll, we'll, keep, we'll, we'll keep working uh, with you on your on your jokes, Travis. They need uh, they need they need uh, like uh, everything. They need a little everything. Oh, hey, I liked those. Oh, thank you. You had a couple there, of stellar ones in there. I worked really hard. You know how bad my normal jokes are. Okay, well that's all the time that we have today. I want to thank Allison and Keaton for being on the panel and for a great discussion. Thanks for having us. I want to thank Royalty Free Music from bensound.com for our theme. And lastly, I want to thank everybody for tuning in. I do have one favor to ask, though, and that is if you like what you hear, make sure to give us a like and subscribe on YouTube. And if you have an idea of something that would be good to talk about on the podcast, feel free to shoot us a note at splicepodcast at gmail.com. Until next time, remember... It always seems impossible until it's done. Nelson Mandela